All right, we're live. Yeah. Hello, everybody. If you give it a few seconds, normally I throw on uh, uh, Instagram to let people know I'm live. I'm about to get a, a stand that'll stay okay, here yeah. and record it. <laughs> um, so everyone, um, this is Marvin Johnson. Uh, and as you can see by his, uh, his name, he is the co-founder of Dashable. Uh, the way I do the show format is always I explain how I met the person, then I go into their background, they go into their background, and then we, we talk about things that, that are going on. So Marvin, I met through the interesting process of putting out our first um, partnership um, kind of call for startups with Village Capital. So Metabronx uh, partnered with Village Capital last year to work um, on helping companies become more and more investable. What that means is startup founders, normally from communities of color, don't really understand the, the, the way venture capital wants them to present themselves to get funding. <coughs> Marvin does not have that problem. We're gonna get, we're gonna get into his story, it's pretty funny. And I, we'll, we'll keep it PC. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Village Capital has, has partnered with us to give us um, a course that will allow us to give um, people like Marvin a better path towards venture capital. Mm -hmm. So we put out a, an application process mm -hmm. and we got about 50 to 60 applications. And Marlon was one of the, the Marvin, Mar we got another founder named Marlon, so I may do that a lot. Um, Marvin was one of Marvin and his team was one of six we chose. They were um, a very good startup called Dashable. And first, let's talk about your who you are, your background, and then we'll talk about Dashable. Okay, a little bit about who I am. So my name is Marvin Johnson. You already said so. Um, a pretty um, varied background. You know, started out in the U.S. military. I was a nuclear submarine officer, so I had an ROTC scholarship out of college. I went to the military and served as a nuclear submarine officer. Um, then got an MBA and then went to work at a software company for a little while um, where I did some account management, product management, product development, things of that nature. And I always had an entrepreneurial spirit. So I um, started a, a company, information security comp company with my current co-founder, Tony Carter, um, developed a couple secure applications, a secure chat client and a secure um, email and document transfer client. Um, or, or software. I say client, I mean software. Um, and then left from there and started another company called iCobo with Tony. It was an international money transfer company. So we're kind of competing with the likes of PayPal back in the old dot-com days, helping people send money around the world pretty easily um, using prepaid cards and the internet. Um, and after that, you know, went to, went to, um, after we sold that company, um, wanted to get some corporate experience and went to work for MasterCard for about seven years or so. And at MasterCard, I was a VP and director of new product development and product management at MasterCard, mainly focused on prepaid issuance and debit card issuance. Um, and of course, and I've always had entrepreneurial spirit. And then recently we started Dashable. We launched Dashable last year. February, um, February 2019. And my old co-founder, Tony Carter, is also the co-founder in Dashable. We launched Dashable really to make it easy and affordable for small, medium-sized businesses to advertise and find, and more importantly, retain new customers by offering um, limited deals or local deals and promotions. Um, and also to make it easy for consumers to find and redeem those deals at a, in an affordable way. So we launched Dashable. I think we may talk about it a little bit later, but it's just a way to help businesses and consumers connect via deals and promotions in a way that works for both businesses and consumers. Cool. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, let's start out with your background. Like I know um, you said you started out in the military and, you know, then you transitioned to technology. I, I've been talking to a few military people within this whole um, uh, pandemic time. And it seems like a lot of military people go towards technology after you know, and, and I have a, a family member who does the same. And what, why do you think that is? Like, I've just been seeing that a lot lately. Is that is that something that they push on? Or, or you guys realize when you're getting out, that's one of the only opportunities or I, I best think, opportunities? I think we realize in the military, and the military is all about solving problems, especially I was an officer in the military, and you always are trying to figure out what the next step is. You're, get, you're always in a situation trying to figure your way out of a situation to figure the best course of action to solve problems. I mm -hmm. think technology is a way to solve problems. So it's technology is a way where you can see a problem and try to solve it with the technology. So it's pretty 
technology gives it a, a diverse way of solving different kinds of problems. And in the middle, you know, I guess that's some of the training we get. You see things, how can I fix that? How can I make it better? How do we get out of this situation? Whether it be saving lives or getting from here to there, it's all about problem solving and you no know, technology is a way to solve all kinds of problems that exist in society. No, that makes a lot of sense actually. Like, yeah, I mean, I, in the last week or so, I've spoken to a guy who went to work for AWS, Another guy does IT, another guy does IT, my own cousin does cybersecurity, another friend of mine does cybersecurity, all military, and this is all like within a week. And I'm like, yeah. wow, wait a minute, I never <laughs> noticed that. Um, but it makes sense. Like it is, it is one of the only, you know, good jobs coming out of the military that that because my like for instance, my cousin has a bunch of certifications because he was in the military that mm -hmm. is tough to get if you're not you're not in the military. Yeah. So companies want that and he can you know, and that's where I see another huge opportunity for people in the military. Yeah. Um, so talk about your early, your early experiences in the tech founder, you know, uh, world. Like I, I know me and you, we've had discussions and of course we'll keep it PC for the audience, but uh, yeah. <laughs> unless you don't care, <laughs> unless you don't care to me, really care. <laughs> I, I, so that, yeah, I mean, it makes for more interesting conversation. Yeah. We can talk about how we really speak about this. Yeah. Um, talk about your first experience and, and your first startup experience. So my first startup was fair. It was really my second was Icobo. So we kind of rolled the first company, um, which was called Cypherlink into Icobo. And Icobo is what we really spent a lot of time developing. And at the time it was a really, um, really unique idea. It was almost you no know, 15 years ago now. And we built things that people are just building now in financial services. Like you see Cash App and Venmo, you know, PayPal, things like that. Mm -hmm. We developed that stuff like 15 years ago. We had prepaid cards. You could send money to your friends and family, all that stuff a long time ago, pretty much before it was time. So nice, nice, some yeah. of the situation we had was a really hard business to build. And we built a global business um, with a small team. And a lot of people didn't realize what the the power of what we're building was and the, the, um, the how big it could be. So we got a lot of pushback regarding how big it could be, but we did make it big. And we grew from like a really small company to making $400,000 a year to making 4 million on the track to making 16 million the next year. It's like really growing really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And it um, seems like it's gonna be a sweetheart story. You know, we're, we're going off to the races. We're all going to be billionaires, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing about it was we really knew our business really well. And we built a really strong business, but it was really difficult for us to raise money. Um, we attribute some of that to being like, you know, the timing of the market. You no know, people will. It was like a downturn in the market. Also being it seemed like being African-American and having a, a team of four African-American founders starting the company also kind of played a role in our, our ability to raise funds. And we kind of oh, saw that, you know, empirically, we also saw it practically when speaking to people where we'd um, have conversations with people over the phone and they're really like hot and heavy. We want to come invest. We want to come invest. I mean, and then the person and the, the tone was trying to kind of change sometimes. Um, I think things a lot, that was a while ago. I think things have gotten better, a lot better now. Um, there are a lot more entrepreneurs of color now doing things and raising money. So it's a little bit easier. I think that that still plays a role because um, to me, um, people tend to invest in people that they can, you know, identify with. Sure, sure. Investors, when they look at a person of color across the table, they don't see them, they don't see a reflection of themselves. Yep, so yep. they have to take that that leap um, to invest in somebody that, that may not feel comfortable engaging with on a personal level, doesn't look like them, doesn't have the same background, but they may have a good idea and they'd be very capable. So a lot of people have a hard time understanding those unconscious biases and getting over it. It's just human nature to some degree. 100%, because what, what investment is, is trusting a person in a way that, you know, they're going to get you your money back plus, right? So if yeah. you, if there's like an unconscious level of com uh, discomfort just off, you know, not, not being the same as that person. That's why yeah. a lot of, I, I think a lot of white men invest in white men, right? Cause it's like, Oh, I, I see myself in that person. Right. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, as, as I think as the stuff is starting to evolve, they're starting to become, you know, less color lines, but it's still, it's very, it's very tough. Like at the end of the day, especially in a, a climate like right now, right? Like there's going to be less, you know, than normal mm -hmm. investment, but you know, being, being Brown and in this, in this world is very, is very tough, you know? And I think that's part of why we did this village capital thing. Our, our plan to create, when we created Meta Bronx, it was to find people exactly like you. You have the experience, your background is awesome. You have a great idea. You just don't have the clear path with 
without the hurdles, right? Mm -hmm. So what we've been trying to figure out is how to like clear those hurdles. And Village Capital has done a, a, an amazing job of that for us. You you happen to be in the first cohort. So mm -hmm. we're, and you also are in the time of the pandemic. <laughs> so you are you're kind life. of getting screwed in a way because we were supposed to have your demo day at Google, right? Yeah. In like a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, Oh man. So, and then also our, our programming is very heavily in person because a, a lot of what the village capital method is, it's called peer due diligence. And you've, you've gone through that a little bit. Um, yeah. but it means you have, so as a startup founder, you have a great idea, mm -hmm. but if you can't give that idea to another founder and that founder understand it and make it clear that it makes sense to them, then you'll never be able to convince an investor. So what the village capital method does is it, it puts two entrepreneurs against each other, not against, but like to um, work together and they have to convince each other of their point. And if yeah. they, if it, if it's tough to convince another entrepreneur, then it becomes very tough to convince a, a venture capitalist. So that process, now we're going to start figuring out how to take that online, you know, with like a zoom breakout rooms and stuff yeah. like that. We've been, we've been having meetings with, with uh, village capital about the best way of doing that. Yeah, so, Basically, now I want you to start talking about, um, actually, there's a part in your story that I feel like is very educational. Okay. I think you were, you were off to the races and you, you know, you, you got to a point where most startups don't even get, yeah. right? Like, yeah. and then it, it started to fail. Can you talk about that in the most, you know, in the best way you can talk about it in public? You know, I know the true story, but the best okay. way you can educate any entrepreneur, not just the yeah. brown one. Yeah. And why why that went south. Okay. And I think a lot of this came through like the background, your background experiences kind of help kind of form the decisions that you make or determine the decisions that you make. And I came from a pretty um, I guess upstanding background. I was a boy, I was actually a boy scout, though, then I was in the military. I was in the military. So I had a certain mindset of people being direct, upfront, being honest. Everybody wants the best for the team, your best for your platoon or whatever. And so um we decided we we really wanted to raise venture capital for Icobo. We actually were we, we had become profitable. We could be self sustaining. We're making enough money, but we had this idea. We really wanted to raise venture capital so we can really blow it up big, 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 and and and, and really compete with PayPal and Western Union back then. Um, so we signed a term sheet. Um, we read the term sheet. We really had some really good attorneys. We had some of the best attorneys in the, in the business, and the term sheet had some stipulations in it, um, like claw. I won't get into the details, but clawback provision. A lot of things that gave some preferences and power to the investors coming in. Yep. And we looked at it, clause here, clause here, clause here. Each clause in and of itself wasn't a big deal. But when you add these clauses together, you know, we add this with this and that with that, the, the investors got a lot of power. And they kind of um, strung the negotiations out for a long time to kind of put us over a barrel. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we couldn't grow because we were just making enough money to break even. So we really want to get the money and they got kind of a point where we got, got kind of desperate to get the money in so we can continue to grow the business. Um, mm -hmm. They came in and we actually gave them 51% ownership of the company and control of the board. They got three this, boards. And this was when they, when they brought in how much money? At that time, it was, was, that, it was a few million dollars at that time. So, so, so you were at a valuation of about four million, four million because they gave you yeah. two, and then yeah. fifty-one. And you, you guys were willing to give up fifty-one percent just out of lack of understanding, or you knew that was the only option. We, 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 we felt we thought it wasn't really the only option, but it's something we want to do because we really wanted the money for. We had this mindset we wanted to raise venture capital. So, and we sure. looked at the things. No, I like, see that a lot. That's why I'm asking this question. <laughs> That is a major, major thing, right? Yeah. People just want that like banner on their yeah, chest yeah, that they see. did it. But when you did it, and you're not the only one that I know that's done this, you know, you can take that that million, two million, and now you've given up too much of the company. Yeah. So it does it, it, it ruins the trajectory of the company, right? So yeah. explain how how that was going on. You know? So some of it was strict ownership and also there's some revisions that gave them specific voting rights and ability to do things without our permission, like the ability to sell the company, things of that nature. So we had there were some provisions oh, in wow. there. So the first thing they did when they got control was they said, Oh, we took a closer look at the book, took a look at your financials. You're not really worth as much as we thought you were. Well, I'm going to put some more money in and do a down round. So we're now oh, going to devalue your company. Wow. Um, we're going to issue a separate class of stock for ourselves. Not and were you ourselves. able to fight that at all? Were you able to like contest that? 
it's de- it's all comes to deep. So we we did get attorneys and we did fight it. Um, but it would cost us like two hundred fifty thousand dollars to fight it. You know, oh and that had to come out of our personal pockets. And it come to a point where if you're fighting for a year and we're and I was at a point where I wanted to leave the company, and which I ended up doing. If you, I were, leave, you were one of two co-founders. How many co-founders? Four of us. That time we started with four. At that time, there's three of us left. So wow. um, and this how long? How many years? It's over a three year period. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So That's long story short, they tried to really leverage their power and which they did. They were successful in doing it. We had a couple of meetings with the attorneys and meeting with them across the big boardroom table with the attorneys. We ended up dropping the case. It was just too expensive to try to pursue it. And if we weren't going to be there running the company, we know the company wasn't going to grow. Um, so long story short, they kind of um, we got a little bit of cash out of it, but um, they kind of took the company and kind of ran into the ground after that. So question, I'm, I'm on I'm on Instagram promoting that we're on. Is Dashable on Instagram, right? Dashable's on Instagram. Dashable's on Instagram, yeah. At Dashable. Yeah. At Dashable, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, wait, wait. Come meet my... All right, wait. <laughs> so, so basically... The the interesting part, and I don't know how much you want to talk about the way it happened, the way they totally ripped it away. Mm. You know, with the there was some some like shenanigans. I'm not sure if you want to get into that, but you know, if not, it's cool. We'll move on. <laughs> but like, part of it is I'm just trying to educate because because your story is one of the most interesting stories of how a company can be taken away. Mm-hmm. And you not even understand until it's too late. Yeah. Right. We kind of understood what could happen, but when you looked at it, we looked at well, that would never happen because that wouldn't make sense for people to do that because it was it wouldn't fit anybody. Their, their benefit, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Because the company was too immature. They thought the company was more mature than it was. They thought it was. They looked at the numbers. We're growing really fast. We're doing a lot of good things, and they're like, oh, we can just come and take it without. And these people, these guys leave, they just leave. We still have the, we still have the asset, which is the company, but it was still, we had a really close knit company or almost 50 people in the company. And most of them had no, we only, we only, it wasn't a lot of turnover. So it was like a big family. We, we used to work seven days a week in the office. Most people without being asked or told everyone, everyone has, everyone has stock in the company, whether you were mm-hmm. receptionist answering the phone, customer service or the CEO, everyone had equity in the company. And we use that equity as a driver that we're all sure, in this sure. the team. So people really worked hard. We um we worked from seven in the morning till 10, 11 o'clock at night. We worked Saturdays, we worked Sundays, we had pizza together every night, we had we hung out on the weekends. So when things went south, I ended up leaving, you know, people just started like everyone people started throwing their hands up and everyone started leaving the company. And the VCs are left there with a company and not really know what the company does and how to operate it and everyone's leaving but jumping ship. So okay. it didn't serve anybody's purpose. You can do that with an, uh, if it was a, a large company that's been around for 20 years, maybe you can get rid of the, the manager team and the, and the factory sure. keeps going. But this was still like a family and we're all close knit. It was like a really solid team. And they disrupted that team dynamic, which kind of led to the demise of the company more than anything else. So, so if you have to look back and give yourself advice, what advice would you give yourself being in that situation again, what would you do different? Like yeah. I've, I've had this conversation with many, I would really like to give the audience your yeah. So I think the thing is never feel desperate and never feel that you can't find another way out of the situation. Cause building a company, you're always finding solutions to hard problems. Every day we're finding solutions to hard problems and even money. So when, even when it comes to money, there are other f- ways to finance your company or grow and not and don't take money for the sake of taking money from somebody who should, the, all money is not the same. There's good money, there's bad money, there's smart money, there's dumb money, and there's malicious money and benevolent money. <laughs> so yes. yeah, all yeah, that and it's money. hard, to, it's hard to know that. So I, yeah. I even know I even know someone who took money from a venture capitalist who end up in like a Me Too scandal, and then nobody wanted to invest alongside them wow. because of that, right? So you just never know, and it's, mm-hmm. some things are out of your control, like that one, right? Like. Yeah. You, I could have known that. Yeah. Then, you know, stuff like what happened to you, I feel like was predatory, you know, mm-hmm. in a way, but yeah. also very dumb. Like, yeah. well, you <laughs> know, like I, that's part of like, it's so interesting learning about all these stories because it just, it, it just proves to you that humans are humans and it's, it's a lot of luck. It, I don't mm-hmm. think it has to do with the smartest people win. 
<laughs> like it's just it's luck and being lucky enough to take money from the right person, being lucky enough to have the right team, being lucky enough to have the right idea at the right time. Because if yeah. you would have came out with that idea right now, yeah. it would have been off to the races. You could have yeah. probably raised 10 times the amount of money from yeah. good investors. You know, so time. So one of my mentors, Paco, always says, timing is not everything. It's the only thing, right? Yeah. So like basically that, that just 15 year difference would have made the, all the difference in the world for that idea, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, it sucks, but at least now you have, you get to this, right? So yeah. I think everything is learning experience, right? So now you're at Dashable. Explain to everybody what Dashable does, you know, give us the link. I'll put it on the chat. Okay. Well, it's www.dashable.com. Dashable with an I, D-A-S-H-I-B-L-E. Um, so what Dashable does, you know, we had the idea for Dashable when, um, after dealing with some people who had some bad experience with Groupons. That's where the initial concept came up. Um, we talked to some business owners who had run Groupon deals and they were just complaining to us, for lack of a better word, about how egregious um, Groupon was to them from a financial standpoint and the inability to get return customers. People would just come use a Groupon deal. Groupon takes a lot of money from the business. They, a lot of customers come, but they don't come back. And from the customers- Let me down a little even more because I, I, I'm pretty sure people don't know this, right? And I didn't even know it because I yeah. never, I only dealt with Groupon from the consumer side, not yeah. the, 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 the play side. Yeah. So Groupon puts um, companies in a tough position because as a Groupon um, vendor, mm -hmm. you have to offer um, a product at a lot less cost than you normally would. So let's say you sell um, something that costs $100. You have to put it on Groupon for like $50, 50 right? Yeah. And then Groupon does what? What do they do exactly? So first of all, Groupon collects the $50 on behalf of the business. So Groupon has the $50 for the service. So this, the business doesn't get anything. Then when you okay. actually, as a consumer, buy that Groupon from Groupon, give Groupon 50 bucks. Then you go to the business owner or whomever and you give them the Groupon. They provide services for you. They have to pay for the food, whatever they're providing. They have to pay for the services, time, materials, blah, blah, blah. And then you know, weeks later, Groupon gives the business a check for $25 of the 50 so groupon keeps half that money so, so, so that, sitting there that is, like, i've given all this product away i had to wait to get my money that only get a small percentage of what i would otherwise get so it's not a good situation and the customers they take the groupon i may never see them again so yeah, because they came just because it was cheap and the hope was i guess in groupon's mind the hope was you you come to these places and then you want to come back and pay full price but that really rarely happens that right really rarely happens, and yeah. so now if you, if you operate a business at a hundred percent, right. And you know, mm. normally your margin is 50. That means the thing actually costs you $50 that you're selling mm. for a hundred, yeah. but you're giving it to Groupon for 50 yeah. and then they're giving you 25. So you're actually losing money doing Groupon yeah. as yeah. a vendor. Yeah. Right? Well, That's yeah. pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. So we saw that and said that, that, that can't work long. It's not sustainable long-term for businesses. You know, it's like running a Super Bowl ad for a business. You pay a lot of money. No, you get a big splash. Hopefully the awareness will, will the awareness, yeah. but you're not really using it to generate revenue. So um, we think there's a better way because businesses, they, deals and promotions are, are a good way to drive business to your customers, to your business, but it has to be in a way that makes sense for the business. And on the dashboard platform, we allow businesses to set their own discounts. They can run different types of deals. They can do like a percentage off, like 50% off if they want to. They do a buy one, get one free, and they do a fixed price, like, you know, get a hot dog for a dollar, those types of things. Um, and we let them set their own promotions. And we see on our platform, most businesses are comfortable with a 10 to 20% discount. So that's what that's yeah. what works for them so they can still grow their business. Operate, without, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without going out of business, yeah. So what I really liked about your, your platform is like it's a merge of multiple ideas where it's, it's about where you go as well, not mm -hmm. just if you like things. So as yeah. you're walking through the city, certain things are geolocated to let you know, oh, there's a deal, you know, as you dash through the city pretty yeah, much. Right? Yeah. So that's why it's called Dashable. Yeah. Um, so I think that's super interesting. And I guess right now, what are you doing since people can't walk around the city? What, <laughs> what's, what, what is your, your goal right now? How are you so doing? right now we're kind of like pivoting as they say a little bit. So we're looking at doing more of like online digital deals. The first thing we did, cause we had, no, we just launched the service, um, pretty soon before the COVID-19 pandemic started. We had a little over a hundred businesses on our platform. So the first thing we did, we called all our businesses to see how they were doing. It was like a bittersweet story. You no, know, a lot of the businesses you no know, aren't weren't doing well. Um, they yeah. either shut oh. down, 
most businesses, most in-person businesses shut down, but the restaurants were still open. And restaurants- Are you doing, are you doing cloud kitchens, a lot of your, your customers? Oh, uh, what's that? A lot of your, are a lot of your vendors you doing cloud kitchens? Not really doing cloud kitchens, but a lot of the restaurants are doing takeout and delivery only. Takeout and delivery, yeah. yeah okay. Some are shut down, um, others are doing takeout delivery. So what we started doing, even though our platform wasn't set up for doing like takeout and delivery type of deals, we allowed them to at, put those deals in our platform for free. So if you have okay. ever a restaurant, you have a takeout and delivery deal, we'll post in our app for free. We also put a website, a web page up on our website is dashable.com slash together. Okay. Um, like we're all in this together. So if you go to dashable.com slash together, you'll see a, a listing of all the takeout and delivery deals in New York City area on a map. So you can find the ones that are close to you. And we're not charging the consumers anything to use the service. And we're not charging businesses anything at all to use the platform. So we're trying so, to do it. Go ahead. So are they still giving discount right now, even though it's tough times? Yeah, they are still giving discounts. Some of them are still giving like a small discount, like 10% off or free delivery, things of that nature. Sure. And one of the things that we've discussed with businesses is it's better for you to call the business directly um, and order so they can pick the delivery service that's better for them. Because some of the delivery services oh. charge a large fee. So um, they said it's better to call them directly, place the order over the phone. And they, so they choose to deliver it in a way that makes sense for them to deliver it. So, and your platform allows that because your platform is not a delivery platform. It allows them to, to have that option. Yeah, it just allows it allows them pretty much to advertise the deal that they have, so you can easily find them. Because one of the things that's hard to find right now is which restaurants are open, which restaurants are closed right exactly. now. So, on exactly. our website, we only have the ones that are open, the ones that are actually offering takeout delivery currently. So I would think that that's a little bit of an opportunity for you, right? I think right mm -hmm. now. And let's get into it. Like, this is what I like. This is, this is the best part of this. Like, I try to, like, brainstorm ideas. Yeah. Um, this is probably an opportunity for you because right now, these restaurants are looking for any opportunity to make sales, right? Because yeah. it's such a tough time. Yeah. So if I were you, I'd be reaching out to any open restaurant yeah. and saying, hey, I want to feature you on, on our platform for free. Yeah. I, just want, I just want to make sure you are there. You know, but you know, that's one side though. Then you have the user side, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing, I think from our conversations, uh, you know, it's easier to get vendors on the platform than people on the platform. Yes, right? it is. Yes. So, so what are you doing on the people side right now? So I know, oh, oh, let me bring up the way you were doing it before, <clears throat> which I thought was a very smart way. It's just not as smart anymore. With COVID, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you were creating these like parties, these launch parties at yeah. these places where you would bring people in. Yeah. with the app and the vendor, and then it will put people on your platform. So what is your new um, idea post-COVID? Our, our new idea right now is, uh, of course, we're doing online advertising, things of that nature, but we're starting to do um, virtual events. We have our first virtual event tomorrow. We're doing our free oh. workout session with a trainer who was actually using our platform. His name's so, Sarvin so how, how can people find that? Where was the link? So you can go to our, um, there, should, there may be a link in, the, in our website at the bottom called events. They're supposed to add it yesterday. Hopefully it's there already. We're posting them on Instagram. Also, if you go to our Instagram and click the link in our bio. Um, oh, yeah? Okay. The link All in our right. bio, okay. the, the very first link is to our event listing. There'll be one event um, for our, our workout tomorrow. So we're planning okay. on doing um, events, virtual events, vir virtual workouts, um, like these body weight conditioning workouts. Um, we have a boxing trainer who's going to do some stuff. We have somebody who's going to do some online cooking classes and demos. And we're also going to start interviewing the different um, business owners that are on our platform and, and getting pretty much their COVID-19 coronavirus story, you know, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, and the thing about it, some businesses are doing better. Uh, we're actually doing a, we're working with a company called Baked Cravings. Um, I shouldn't even mention it yet. We haven't finalized it, but we're looking, working with a bakery um, to raise money to deliver cupcakes to, um, for you no know, first responders. So trying to do a lot of things, you know, to build some goodwill in the community, get our brand out there, and try to help you no know, businesses you know weather the storm that we're going through because we're all we're all you know I wouldn't say suffering. We're all we're all have been negatively affected. Even though some businesses are doing a little better, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. It that that's a big thing, right? Like at the end of the day, what this what this has done is, and I put the link on the event um, on everywhere. Um, I think what this is doing right now is forcing people to think very far into the future, mm -hmm. but not as far as we thought, right? Before yeah. we, you know, people like us that are in technology knew a lot of things were being automated, so people so uh, jobs are going to be less and less. Yeah. But right now, seeing it in action and snapshot and being able to say, all right, we lived it. What is a way to to create a business that can work in this environment, right? Yeah. 
because once we come out of it, if you can work in this environment, it can work in any environment, right? Mm-hmm. So what I think with your idea is is a very huge opportunity is people right now have less money, so they, they're going to be looking for the deals. They're going to mm-hmm. be walking around the city less, yes, but the fact that Groupon right now as a business, you it's almost impossible to be on Groupon if you're mm-hmm. you're in this scenario, right? Yeah. Because you can't even afford to lose money like that anymore. Oh. Like, you know, so, you know, but Groupon has a, a large stranglehold on people understanding uh, and their branding is and their advertising is so large yeah. that people know them. So your challenge right now is becoming known, right? Yeah, so, exactly. you know, this virtual idea is good. What, what are some other ways? I know, of course, there's always advertising and stuff like that. What are some other ways that you're thinking about, you know, creating because right now everybody's home, right? So yeah. you could be creating content. You know, one one thing I would do if I were you is maybe look for some influencers that right now are looking for. Yeah. You know, you yeah. Know, I don't know. I'm taking notes too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, like for instance, I know I know an influencer that does um, exercise training. Like mm-hmm. like her and her boyfriend do exercise training. They have. She has like 200,000 followers on Instagram, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe the way I could connect you and you could be, she could do 10% off through your platform. And she tells everybody, go through the platform. The thing that I would see is what's the benefit for them, right? Right now, since you're an early platform and the the views are not there yet, Mm -hmm. what are you you giving the the vendors as the... um, the benefit. What what is another benefit other than views? For for the um for the people like influence things of that nature. So yeah. we're also we also have we do have a, a, a pretty decent following, not as big as that. So we're able to drive traffic to them. And like the um the trainers were doing the the event for us tomorrow, he's also collecting donations. So it's another way from the generate some revenue as well. So we're kind of doing oh, yeah. this normally where they we're helping promote each other. And any revenues that's received, whether it be donations or fees for those classes, no, the um the person providing the content retains that revenue. So we're not trying to make money from the the vendors or people we're working with. We're just trying to help build a dashboard brand and what and get to the end of this, so we can really start you know, building our business. Um, so that's a good that's yeah. a good that's a good thing right there. The the payment process sometimes that is expensive for like if you're not doing it on a large scale, you have to pay these vendors or whatever. You know that payment process could be a reason to use your your system too, right? It's yeah. kind of like, you know, we'll handle the payment and you get paid the whole thing, but you know, you don't have to deal with that. Yeah, that could be another good thing. So, so that's an idea, right? I could I could try to connect you with with them, see if it's something they would want to do. Yeah. Um, I definitely like the virtual event thing. I think that's a good idea. Um, but I would do it in a, a format of how are you doing right now? Zoom. Probably Zoom. So the first one trying Zoom for the the one tomorrow. Yeah. So the thing with Zoom is not not you know you I think you were the one that that, that put me onto the privacy thing first, yeah. right? You yeah. were one of the first with your military background. Um, but Zoom only streams to one one um platform at a time. So if you created the video, it could be streaming live on YouTube or Facebook, and yeah. you have to pay a lot for that to happen. Yeah. I don't know if people are doing that. I was doing that with other shows and mm-hmm. then I found this platform called StreamYard and I'll put Stream the link, I'll put the link in because I get a commission if you press that link. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll put the link in the audience because this it does this, right? So right mm-hmm. now me and you are talking, but it only limits to six people on the screen. So wow. the, the the thing about this though is it streams to Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Um, Twitch and LinkedIn, if you're allowed, LinkedIn is okay. in process, but it'll yeah. do all that at the same time. So you get more views, you have less people, but you get more views. Mm-hmm. And then if people ask questions, it pulls up the questions on the screen and you could, you can, you can talk about the questions. So it's, it's a cool platform. So check it out. Um, we definitely use it for, we're going to start doing interviews with some business, business owners. Um, the first one's going to be this week. So we actually do, it's like short interviews, kind of like this. And this is a perfect platform for it. Well, we'll talk to different business owners and see, you know, how they've been dealing with COVID-19 and hear their stories, you know, horror stories or or success stories as well. I think, I think right now is the greatest time ever for that because everybody's looking for that leg up and storytelling is all we can do right now. It's literally all we can do. Right. So I'll put the link in the, in the thing and I'll email it to you. Um, So 
right now, having them on, talking about what's going on, you know, first, like like I did with you, their history, right? Because mm-hmm. right now, everybody's screwed. I don't care how rich you are. You're screwed yeah. in some way, right? Yeah. So, you know, you want to talk about the good times, you know, and then, you know, now what's going on. So to me, mm-hmm. I believe that's a great idea. And this format, it goes up to six people, you know, on the okay. screen. And you could do screen sharing if needed. Mm-hmm. So, like, for instance, I could pull up, uh, and, and I'll do that. Actually, I'm going to do that. I'm going to pull up your um, your dashable site real quick right now. So, yeah, and all right, so what else? What else? I know we haven't caught up in a while. What are some other things that, you know, you you don't mind talking about in public? What else do you need help with that, that <laughs> maybe one of my audience can help or I can't? Yeah. So the thing right now, the thing that's always an issue is, you know, we're looking for we're looking for businesses to add to our directory that have takeout delivery deals. So if you're aware of businesses that are still operating doing takeout delivery, if you'd like to hear about them, you can DM us or send us an an, um, an email at info at dashboard dot com. So and, I'm already there, I think I can help with that because I have other friends that have businesses, tech businesses that deal with restaurants. So I'll find out what which ones they are, or I'll just connect you direct because maybe there's a there's a you know opportunity for both of you guys to join um business develop right so you may have restaurants that he can use and he has restaurants mm-hmm. that you can use. exactly and we actually started doing that so since we have, i wouldn't say downtime we're working on some back-end things right now so we're actually partnering with another company called eat okra and oh, they're yeah, talk, talk about what they're 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 directly they list black owned restaurants across the United States. Um, they have a pretty decent, pretty large following of people with the app. So you go to the app, um, eat okra, and you can see um, black owned restaurants in your area and then order food from them or, or visit those restaurants. So what we're actually doing is we're actually building contact and we're building an API to our platform. So we're building a way for other apps, platforms to communicate with Dashable. So and our first partner is is Eat Okra. So if you're an Eat Okra business, you can sign up for Dashable via Eat Okra, create Dashable deals, and those Dashable deals will appear in the Eat Okra app. So we're looking for partners in that area. So if you're a partner, if you're a business that um, technology business that services small, medium sized businesses, you have a technology platform that may be a way for us to integrate our platforms together and work together from a not even, not only a business development standpoint, from also a technology standpoint. So right now, just going to the site, it seems like you you, you are catering right now more to, to food. I know that's not the always the situation though, no. right? You, any you know, like you said, you have fitness. Is is there a specific type of deal that you wish you had more of? Uh, so we, before the, before all this happened, the things we're looking at really increasing on the platform were, were health and beauty, like nail oh, salons, yeah. hairdressers. We hear of a lot of requests for those type of deals and pets. You no, know, with we were doing these events before, talking to a lot of customers. They wanted to see, like, where can I? I want deals on getting my nails done, getting manicures, pedicure, hair done. And oh, and, I remember this. I remember this. Yeah. We had this conversation because you were saying like that demographic. You know, they don't have a lot of promotion, and you could you could yeah. really help them. Yes, yeah. I remember this. I remember this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough right now. And of, course, <laughs> of course, of course, fundraising. So if anybody out there is an investor, we want to talk to you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fundraising right now. And here's, I'm going to tell you this system that I've been working on and I don't know where you are with your funding and your raise, but I've been telling, and, and I don't know, you've probably seen it in the Slack of Meta Bronx, but I've been telling all the founders to check out this book called Slicing Pie, mm-hmm. right? Because Slicing Pie is a, is a, is an awesome book that basically, in my opinion, helps you get investment in time and money much easier. And I've used it on, on projects that I'm working on in this pandemic and I've raised money and I've gotten help for free okay. during this pandemic using this system. So awesome. what it does is it talks to people about equity from day one, you give it in time, your time is a result as a result gives you either equity or money. If I can't pay mm-hmm. you, I figure out how to give you equity, but it's based yeah. on everybody's pie, right? Like Marvin yeah. has done a certain amount of time on this. If I come in and give one hour, that doesn't mean I, I should own the same percentage as Marvin, right? So yeah. it's basically a way of making it feel fair to bring people in and also investors in. So the way it does it, it says, look, if I can't pay you for your time, I'm going to give you double what your time is worth in equity, equity. right? And if I can, if, if right now, if, if you give me money, I'll give you four times what that money is valued at in equity. So- yeah. This system, I mean, it's a it's a whole thing. I literally spoke to the author and everything, and it's it's helped me raise multiple money for multiple ideas within this pandemic. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it, it it works. I mean, and and he has he has a whole um accelerator programs like Meta Bronx using it. So that's that was why another reason I'm trying to understand it more and more. But you know, I would highly suggest you check out that book because right now it's going to be very tough to just go to VCs because right now, right? How do you have a VC meeting virtual like this? You know, it's going to be yeah. tough. So what I've done is the slicing pie book has put a, a mentality into me where instead of asking people for money, you ask for advice, right? You, you hear that, that thing, ask for money, get advice, ask for money, ask for advice, get money twice. Right. Yeah. So what I've been doing is I've been going to investors and asking them for time and time and the value of you're going to own equity just for the time. Yeah. I don't need your money right now. Yeah. But while they get in and they start getting into the idea and saying, Whoa, this is a really good idea. Then I hit them with the, Oh, if you want to give money, it's worth four times your money. Yeah. And yeah. then it's like, okay, might as well do that. Cause I'm already giving my time and I like yeah. it, yeah. you know, versus, Hey, just give me money at this valuation. It's a little tough, like yeah. especially right now. Um, and this, this book has been around for a while and, and it's, it's worked even before the pandemic. So, um, I really highly suggest it to all the Meta Bronx founders, of course, but anybody watching and listening that's trying to create an idea because it's not only about raising money because you may just have a need of a person that you can't afford to pay right now, but by giving that person a system that makes them understand what they're going to get out of giving you that time, yes. it's a whole different ball game because I've been in the situation where it's like, don't worry, I'll look out for you. You know, we're, we're going to give you something. We just don't know what it is yet. Yeah. This system has it all set from day one. From day one, you put in an hour, you understand what you're getting yeah. out of it. And then as the founder, you can decide, look, I'm going to just pay you out because it didn't work out. I'll just pay you out. Yeah. You don't own equity. But at least that that time, I really needed it at the time. So I'm going to give you a little bit more just for helping me. That opportunity yeah. cost was worth it to me. Right? Yeah. So... A super interesting book. I highly suggest it for anyone looking for money right now or help at all. So you're looking for more more vendors. You more and, vendors. And mostly restaurant vendors. Yes, right now. Yeah, right now. Well, 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 you are doing the fitness thing. That, that's another opportunity. There, there might be another fitness guy I could get for you on the platform. Um, and are you are you geographically focused right now? Yeah, well, right now it's New York's New York says the five boroughs in around New York. So it's New York. New York City focus, York right? City okay. Right so so you're looking for ways of, of getting more people to download the app. So that could be a cross benefit, right? Maybe yeah. there's a way, maybe there's a way to do this. Take an influencer, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, How about this? You give you give a little bit of a discount so people can come on my platform and buy your service through my platform. And then yeah. also I'll bring other people that don't know about you yeah. on, on maybe to buy your service. But what if I give you $5 for everybody who buys through my platform? Yeah. So let's say, I mean, maybe not $5, maybe it's a percentage, maybe it's not, yeah. yes. right? So this way they get a double win, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, Cause these, I'll be honest, these influencers, a lot of times they're not as financially well off as you would think, mm -hmm. right? even at the heart highest, you know, levels, yeah. million yeah. followers, they're not making a lot of money mm -hmm. off that million following most of the time, most of the time, some are better than others. But if you told them, look, they, they, they think very much like a celebrity, what's in it for me, yeah. you know, up front, right? And you have to kind of figure out how to cater to them first. Mm -hmm. And if you give them something like that, that is a win, right? You say, look, everybody who buys on your platform, I'll give you an extra 10% or whatever. Mm -hmm. 50%, whatever you can afford to do as a business. Yeah. This way makes sense. Now you are using them as advertising, right? So mm -hmm. instead of paying Facebook and hoping people land, you're paying them because they yeah, actually got someone to buy on your platform. Yeah. You yeah. know? So it's a much better use of advertising revenue. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Advertising spend, you know? Yeah. So that, that could be something that I, I can think of a few people like that right now that may work. Um, that, yeah. you know, once we go offline, I'll, I'll connect you with them. Um, or just, you know, reach out to me on Slack on the Meta Bronx Slack and I'll, yeah. I'll cause it might take a little longer to get in touch with people. Um, yeah. so yeah, so I think what I really like about Dashable one is the team, right? Like that's a big part of why we chose you guys. Mm -hmm. You guys have 
a very solid and experienced team, right? So talk to me a little bit about your co-founders and stuff, because I think, I think that's a big part of the puzzle that most founders don't understand. You yeah. have to get a good team. And how'd you think about that? And how'd you do it? Okay. So what we thought about, so I, I've worked with Tony in the past. He's one of my co-founders, he's our CTO. So, you know, I bring a lot of the business acumen to the table. So I'm the one doing things like this and handling all the business side of the house and product development. And Tony is a technology guru. So he can code and design and architect. And he's a security expert. So between the two, uh, the two of us, we can actually, you know, get a product at least to the minimal viable product stage because I can help design it. He can build it to get yeah. something going. So I think if you don't have both pieces of the puzzle, depending on what business you're building, you need to have in that core team the skill set to get a lot of the initial things done if yeah. you don't have the money to pay other people to do it. So that's exactly. our core team. With that core team, we're allowed to get a lot of stuff done before we start bringing other people in. So we expand the, the team from those two to we have nine people now. And like you said, everyone on the team now, we figured out a way to give them equity. Now we have some offshore developers who do some development. They get actually paid you no know, a salary every month. But the rest of us are working for equity and we're building the, the buildings together. When it works, we're all going to benefit from it. So, so we've so even we've, slicing pie, just so you, you understand even that I've been yeah. using, of course, everyone uses offshore for different things. Yeah. And even that slicing pie model, there's a way of even including them in an equity of opportunity, okay. right? Because you can say, Hey, okay. Just to make math easy, this development right here is going to cost $10,000. Mm -hmm. Do you want it all in ten thousand, or do you want to put five thousand in as equity? Right yeah. and now, you, you're taking five, and then you have five thousand as, and it becomes twenty thousand of investment. Yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> right. So in a way, they're invest. They are the lead investor, you know, yeah. or, or not lead. Maybe it depends on where you are, but they are investing in the business, so they can get some upside. Right, yeah. and if you keep some of your costs down right now, especially when it's tough. Right. So that, mm -hmm. that's another cool thing about the slicing yeah. pie idea. Yeah. Um, just, just two more quick things about the team. So just bring people on that actually add value, not just have people just to have people on your team. You know, people have to add some value to what you're doing. And also keep in mind, if you have more than if you're more than a sole proprietor, you know, starting company with somebody is almost like getting married to that person because you're kind of oh, yeah. your financial <laughs> tied together. Your credit can be tied together, you know. That's a lot of stuff that goes into starting business with somebody. And just like marriages, sometimes there's divorces along the way. So okay. you have to plan for that and, and make sure you set expectations. What happens if you and I were to start a business and split it 50 50? What happens if you decide to quit next week? Do you still so, have your So that's another, so that's another set up up front. Yeah. So that's another thing that Slicing Pie does very well. It's not about saying we're 50 50, it's about let the work prove out what we are. Yeah. Because what happens is, most of the time, and I've been in this situation, I'm sure many have, you say 50-50 and one of the partners is doing more and is very clear. Yeah. And that doesn't feel fair and then it, it collapses. Instead, in this system, everything is tracked. Sales, time spent, money raised, um, money put in, yeah. you know, money left in. So let's yeah. say you were able to make 10000 but you said, you know what, I'm going to leave five in. That mm. all adjusts your pie. And then at the end, you see, and the end is usually when you get a huge investment, like a million, two million dollar yeah. investment, then you bake the pie. But in the beginning, when you're trying to get to that level, you don't want to restrict people. You want to let them do as much as they can do. So by, by opening it up and saying, look, these are all the things that will get you more pie, do them and we'll, we'll all win. You you eliminate a lot of the back and forth of should I do this because that's not in my that's not in my and I'm already doing more than fifty percent so yeah. you know I'm gonna do more and and he's gonna own fifty and I'm gonna or she's gonna own fifty and I'm gonna yeah. own fifty and I'm doing seventy five percent plus I'm bringing this million dollar investment it starts to like cloud your judgment and I've literally seen it collapse multiple companies yeah. including ones I've been involved in mm -hmm. right and and I was one of the reasons right because I was the one like. I'm doing a bunch of this work, you know? Yeah. So I really, really like the model of, and I'm doing it right now. I have a startup that I, you know, I can't talk about as much, but um, because my founders don't want to talk about it yet, but I will be soon where I came to the table and I said, look, the idea was thought about, let's figure out who's going to do the work and who's going to bring in the money. And then we figure out equity. I'm not going to say I should own this because I came up with it, this and that. Yeah. Let's all get in, start working and figure it out. And, and, and it'll be yeah. tracked the whole way. So yeah. nobody feels salty. 
And I believe that's the future of a, a way of getting to the point where you you are in the position to be like you were before. Then yeah. after that, you definitely got to make sure you pick the right lawyers. So yeah. that is that is a you know a, something I haven't gotten to yet, but hopefully I will. So I guess we're coming up on ten minutes left. Any anything that you would like to ask of the audience, other than you've already asked about vendors and stuff like that, um, or or of me in the last ten minutes, or, or definitely I gave how how to find you everything. So any last minute things that you want to discuss or or ask of the audience. I say follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook, you know, stay tuned. And uh, we want, you know, we're here to try to you know, provide a benefit to the, to the community. So if you have any ideas of ways we can uh, help, you know, promote businesses and in your area during this COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, let us know. Um, we don't see this as a time for us to try to make a lot of money right now, but sure, time for us to survive sure. and help other businesses survive. So we're looking, we're looking for all that input, input suggestions. No, I, if you see things that could be promoted or advertised, we'd like to see if we can add that to our platform. Um, Aside yep. from businesses, because businesses are easy, we're able to find businesses pretty easily. But there's maybe other things out there where businesses need help promoting themselves. We'd like to know about those things. So I'm gonna ask something that you should have asked, but I'm gonna ask for you. <laughs> Just by watching this and downloading the Dashable app, yep. you help you help Marvin and his yep. team, and you help me and MetaBronx because at the end of the day, just by downloading this app, you have given him some traction for future investors yeah, true, right true. at the end of the day you may never make buy a deal but if you have that app on your phone and maybe once a month you open it and see maybe there is something maybe he gets something that just really att attaches to something you need another big thing you didn't talk about but i'll talk about it really quickly is dashable has a background ai that watches what you like and starts to predict what kind of deals you will more likely enjoy and starts yeah. to show you more things based on where you are and what kind of things you like. So it may eventually start showing you stuff that are really catered to your, you know, yeah. your wants and needs. So I highly just suggest everyone just at least download the app, well, yeah. create a login. That'll help out a founder with an idea. One day you may be a founder and you will understand how hard it is to get people to just download your app. And you, all the time you spend, hundreds of thousands of hours on this thing, <laughs> yeah. thousands of dollars, just by downloading the app and putting it on your phone and creating a login, you will be helping this man and his team. And yeah. of course, Meta Bronx and, and everybody, and you may be helping yourself eventually too. Yeah. So yeah. Um, tell people where it is, how to download it. So you go to the app store or the play store, it's under Dashable. So it's pretty easy to find. Um, or you can go to dashable.com slash apps, A-P-P-S. And I'll link you directly to your appropriate place to download it. So dashable.com slash APPS slash apps. All right. So now let's say they downloaded it. Any, any user advice to make sure once they download it, that they get the best experience. It's hopefully it's very intuitive and self-explanatory. That was the whole goal. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. That makes sense. That makes sense. But let's say, let's say, all right, let's say if it's not, you got Marvin you know, right here. You know. out there explain to him what, what you didn't have or what you wish you had. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess uh, this is a good place to leave it. Um, yeah, I, uh, it was great catching up, and definitely, you know, Thank hit me you. up on the Slack from Meta Bronx about the stuff we spoke about. Um, and good luck, and you know, of course, I'll help out however I can, and hopefully, people watching download. I don't get a million views, but yeah. you know, over time, it will. Yeah, it will go. <laughs> so thanks thanks for coming on the show um and yeah look forward to keeping it going yeah you too appreciate it take care have a good day uh, all right, bye. Bye.